Uh, welcome to the, well, the last installment for this year of the SciArc Cinema Series. Um, this is, uh, this program started in October, and uh, it's a series of screenings of films relating to architecture, to technology, visual culture. Um, they're all free. Uh, they're all ages, which is good. And um, uh, my name is Michael Stock. I'm the host and the I guess, programmer of the series. Uh, I'm also a professor here at SciArc, and I teach courses on film, music, comic books, cultural studies, punk, uh, things like that. Um, <clears throat> this semester, I'm teaching uh, two classes. One is a, is a course on film and architecture, and the other is a class on apocalyptic films, so movies about the end of the world, which, you know, is getting closer, it seems. Uh, so tonight's film, uh, which is the 1997 cult classic, Nowhere, uh, connects with both films, because they're both, it's, it's part of director Greg Araki's uh, teenage apocalypse trilogy, um, and also is, I think, a really important film about Los Angeles, or a version of 1990s Los Angeles. Um, the, the original, I, I, I mentioned this in class earlier today, but the original VHS sleeve uh, of the film when it, came, when it first came out on video described it as an episode of Beverly Hills 90210 on acid. But see, very few of you will get that reference. So just even, Google, Google Beverly Hills 90210 and you will, you will are... find your summer viewing project, I guarantee. <laughs> All the trash. Uh, so. As the title of the film suggests, it's about nothing, it's about nowhere, it's about the emptiness of pop culture, it's about the emptiness of people's minds, it's about sex and drugs, probably most especially, and, um, and also about the very best in indie music in that era. And so you're gonna hear, uh, yeah, you're gonna hear bits and pieces of shoegaze and Britpop and uh, trip hop and grunge, and all put together on a soundtrack at least 10 years before Sofia Coppola did it later on. <laughs> so um, this is a film like I think almost all, I think all of Iraqi's films are about transgression. It's about the importance of outsider status, and this is done long before it was cool. Um, and, and I explained in class today, too, a lot of times, you know, Iraqi in a, a number of interviews mentions how many of his screenings would inevitably break out in fights, whether it's uh, yelling or fist fights. I mean, it, it, these films provoke a real visceral response. And, uh, and I think, uh, let's see here. I think still this movie, like you in the room here, there will be some of you who will love this film. There, I am sure, will be some of you who will hate this film. Um, but this is also a testament to the power of, of Greg Araki, I think, as an auteur, um, as a real pioneer of independent cinema, and of, of something known as the new queer cinema movement in the 1990s. Uh, I guess I would compare him to, like some names I could drop that maybe you would connect with would be someone like Todd Haynes or Gus Van Zandt, uh, Larry Clark or Harmony Korine, who were making films in, in the same period, although on the other coast. And, um, and you know, the, the films of Greg Araki would show, I, I saw, like, it was like a thing for me when I first moved to LA. Uh, in, I guess, the end, middle end of the 1990s, where I would go and see every Iraqi film, just like I would go see every Harmony Corinne film uh, at the Sunset Five, which is uh, Crescent Heights and, and Sunset. And that was the only theater where you could see Greg Iraqi films. And I, it always made me wonder, like, is he paying them off? Is he friends with them? <laughs> I mean, because these were films, yeah, that, that you couldn't find anywhere. Um, this film, Nowhere, I, I feel like is a film that has yet to be rediscovered. The fact that, that this thing isn't on Blu-ray yet, I think is very telling. Like when I, when I first put it on the, on the schedule, along with all these big budget, mostly big budget films, um, I, I got an email uh, from the library being like, this isn't on Blu-ray, like how can we show this? You know, it's like, no, it's important that we show this. Um, this film I don't think has been screened in LA since the 90s. Um, the only time that Greg Araki has gotten his sort of uh, a retrospective or his due was in New York five years ago. Um, 
but maybe given the sort of the, the, the chic of 90s nostalgia, maybe, maybe, maybe his time is coming. Um, I did see that he recently directed an episode of Riverdale, which is the really <laughs> sexy and violent update of the Archie comics story. Um, and I was told, and I will let my guest break the news, that he has a new television program coming out on Showtime very soon. Um, let's see here. Uh, the films, I think, one of the reasons that, that these films will, one of the reasons that, that the films will turn people off is that it has, all these films have ingredients of mainstream commercial depiction of teenagers, um, of this, this cool place uh, that Los Angeles was or fantasized to be um, in the 90s. Um, you've got, you know, these teenagers have cars, they're having sex, they're doing drugs, they're having fun, but it's all really dark. I mean, like, Valley Girl, Heather's less than zero, like that, but even darker. And critiquing the like plastic culture that all these movies were about. Um, uh, let's see here. So while a lot of the 80s and especially 80s films about teenagers uh, we're looking at some of the kind of surfacey stuff. Iraqi's films were looking at eating disorders, sexual abuse, depression, uh, sexual confusion. Um, it was he was one of the first filmmakers making films that had a realistic depiction of characters dealing with HIV, and uh, and I think uh, like his his breakthrough film, uh, The Living End, from 1992, which was a road trip about two characters who had HIV traveling across the country. This was the film that that sort of broke him out, although not necessarily in LA, it was mostly in, in Chicago, in New York, where other independent filmmakers were saying like, who is this weirdo in Los Angeles, <laughs> like the land of Hollywood making these, these weirdo films, you know? Like he was even weirder being in Los Angeles than he would have been in a, a film where independent cinema was, was more popular, I think. Um, so let's see here. Today, uh, I'm honored to be joined up here by the film's production designer, Patty Podesta. And uh, this film, Nowhere, was actually only her second film as production yeah, designer? third, actually. Third film, okay, so in 1996. Um, I'm gonna read, I wanna read to you uh, Patty's bio here. Uh, as an artist, she is recognized for early performance videos, which have been exhibited at museums and festivals in the US and Europe, uh, recognized with numerous awards. She has taught at Art Center for over 20 years, during which time the focus of her career shifted and she became a production designer for film and television. Uh, her spare, moody design for the original and critically acclaimed film Memento, directed by Chris Nolan, which of course was his breakout film, is what put what put you on the map as well. Uh, Patty was nominated for a Primetime Emmy uh, and the Art Directors Guild Award for her work on the film Recount, which reconstructed the events uh, of the contested Florida vote for the presidential election in 2000. Uh, recent projects include acclaimed television series American Gods Han and Hannibal with director David Slade and showrunner Brian Fuller, and Cinema Verite, the Emmy-winning HBO docudrama for which Patty was nominated for the Art Directors Guild Award. Uh, feature credits also include Love and Other Drugs, directed by Ed Zwick, Smart People, directed by Noam Murrow, and Bobby, Miss, uh, Emilio, Emilio Estevan's award-winning account of the day uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated in Los Angeles. Uh, she began her work in the movie business designing title sequence, most notably for Bound, and I guess the, the real original breakout was that, you, was that Patty designed the slideshow <laughs> scene in the original Jurassic Park. Right, which has to get name checked every every introduction. Uh, so I'm skipping ahead. Some of my notes. Uh, let's see. Uh, also, you designed and uh, the exhibition that was dedicated to the work of Stanley Kubrick, uh, which was on view at LACMA from 2012 to 2013. So, so I guess tonight I'm gonna we're gonna talk about the film that you're going to see. And so I guess to start off talking about this film is to start off talking about the beginning of your career as a production designer. And I'm wondering how... How that happened? How did that happen? And, and when did Greg Araki <laughs> find you? Or, or vice versa? Yeah. Um, 
I was making very independent, very, very experimental films and doing performance work. And over this 10-year period, got more and more interested in narrative and realized that the films I was making were more about the backgrounds than they were about <laughs> anything else. And I uh, um, designed something with a group of people and really found that it was great. I had studied architecture. I had thought that I wanted to be an architect or an interior designer like in high school and then became a sculptor and then became obsessed with film and like you saw so many films and it re really became like a, a way of life for me and, and realizing how you can um, produce thought, a thought through a film and, and um, th but I was just talking about this with Liam but I kind of hated actors when I started directing them. They're, or I just didn't know how to take care of them and didn't want to know how to take care of them. And I really realized that I cared intensely about the design and I wanted somebody else to do that other part. So I made this segue. Um, I was about 32 when I started designing features. Um, it was a, not a route that I suggest for many people, but it was my route. Um, and um, I met Greg. It was, this is a funny story, actually, or not funny, but odd story. Um, Therese Dupre, who was a sort of famous production designer who actually died this year, um, had designed the Doom Generation, and she was supposed to design Nowhere also, and had started on it, and then Greg refused to um, cast name people, as of course he would, um, and they diminished the budget by half and then she decided she didn't want to do it anymore. So he started looking for someone else and my, um, a friend of mine at the time knew his producer, Greg's producer, and said, my friend Patty would be great for this. I had also done graphic design um, and as you'll see, the film has a kind of idea about flatness going on. And um, so I went to a meeting with them, with um, Greg and his producer and read the script and, and that was really how it happened. And, uh, and then I also did an, another feature with him, Splendor, after this, and then um, a pilot for a television show that never happened called The End of, This is How the World Ends, which was kind of great, actually. And I just read two days ago that he's going to do a television series with Showtime, and Steve, uh, uh, Soderbergh is going to be the executive producer, who said, yeah, I read the script and it was the strangest thing I ever read, which is a pretty great sentence for Soderbergh to make about Greg and Rocky. But, so I'm kind of in intrigued that he might be um, bringing back these kinds of, these qualities of, of independent filmmaking might be resurfacing into, into the new renaissance of television. Could be interesting. And, yeah, and the, the pilot, which was originally for MTV, yeah. I get, must have been the very end of the 90s, right? 90, yeah. 99 or something. Yeah. So it was rejected because at this point, this is when uh, uh, reality TV shows were actually becoming even more popular than scripted fictional stuff. And so, um, yeah, MTV didn't, didn't pick it up. And the, the pilot's only shown once at, at this retrospective five years ago, otherwise no one has actually seen this thing, which he described as even more fucked up than Twin Peaks. I think that was a direct <laughs> yeah. quote from Greg Arock, so. <laughs> Greg is, um, I th one of the things I think is intriguing to think about is, particularly in the 90s, um, Los Angeles was a company town really run by the movie business, and there was no independent film here. Like you said, people who were making independent films lived elsewhere, and and it's really a, a testament to Greg's um, charm and also his his what competence, but also his insistence on continuing on the work that he that he had this career. He made these little tiny films when he first got out of, of school about ones called Three Confused People in the Night um, about that all had um, kind of sex at their, at their um, heart and, and were shot for no money with no production design. And then as he became more popular, he found that he really wanted candy, the look of candy, um, um, and, and, found, and found budgets for it. So I, kind of, I was going to read this. Yeah, I, yeah. This, is, this was when, in Spin Magazine when the movie came out. Uh, speaking of hand grenades, 
Gregor Rocky's nowhere is characteristically in your face, down your throat, and out your ass, all in a mad swoop of good and fruity image design and proto-punk rudeness. Araki is the candy-colored gay bastard offspring of Jean-Luc Godard and Sid Vicious. And his movies look and move like no one else's. They're sludgy, sugary, aimed right at your lunch. Nowhere is a vision of uh, spelling era teenage LA as an eradicated wasteland of lingering sitcom reflexes, fluorescent contact lenses, bad fashion, and chaotic slang. As with his previous films, The Living End and The Doom Generation, you're convinced the movie is childish swill as it begins to parade by you. But by somewhere in the middle, a Rocky's hyperbole and subteen nose thumbing becomes poignant and even profound. And I actually think that that's a really um, lovely idea, I mean, lovely description of, of what goes on in, in his films. Uh, and I was really intrigued by this idea of expressionism that he was talking about about this film, that the, that the backgrounds would be an externalization of the interior state of the, of the characters. But not the one you think. I mean, uh -huh. it's pretty nuts. <laughs> was, was the, his sort of embrace of expressionism, was that, was this the first film that he did that on? Did he discuss it? that with? I do believe so. Uh -huh. I mean, I, the Doom Generation has that, to a certain degree, it has very strong like black and white. Um, I remember a, a set that was, it, it's like a checkerboard and it mostly is, but this is the first one that really leaves the idea of the real behind in favor of this pop graphic universe that the, that the kids inhabit um, in a seamless way. Um, and you, you mentioned the, the flatness that was so important. Was this, like, was this his direction, or was this your interpretation of w what he was describing? No, that, was I mean, that was, when I went to the meeting, I said, you can't possibly do this um, for the money you have. And he said, no, no, but I want it to all be graphic and flat and very shallow space. And he's describing a kind of psychic state. Um, and then the, you know, whether or not the, the characters can overleap that or run around it or be absorbed into it, I think, is, is part of the plot of the film. It's sort of like flat, shallow. <laughs> it's a, a, you know, a description of a stereotype of the kids at the period. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. there's something, like, as this little quote says, there's something that sort of tugs at you um, later on and, and becomes you know, heartfelt or poignant. <laughs> and were there any, <laughs> did he have any requests for bits of realism that would be no. in with the flatness? No, <laughs> no, no realism. But he had um, ideas about some of the sets already um, when, I, when I got there. Um, you'll see there's an entrance to a, a sort of big rave party, and he said, I want there to be gigantic Lucky Charms marshmallows. I was like, sure. And, uh, <laughs> and a couple of things like that that he had um, and he, he storyboards the entire movie with these tiny little cartoon storyboards. And some of the sets, I think, were sort of touchstones to be hit. And so he did have ideas about what some of them he wanted them to, or the theme that he wanted them to have. You'll see um, in darks, oh, I can show you. Um, I'll show you these couple. I just brought a couple of things because I don't want to um, give it away. I think that the sort of shock value of the film is partially this the candy-colored brightness of it. This is the opening of the film, and I used to show this and say, yes, making films is just as much fun as you think it is when you get to build a 30 feet high shower and then <laughs> pan down it. This is the opening of the film. You're gonna see it in a minute anyway. We, we built this 30 foot high shower. Um, and then this is one of my drawings for the set. And we were thinking through these things a lot. Um, it wasn't typical set drawing where you, where you draw a three-dimensional view of what the set's going to look like. I, we were really thinking through, like, what does color and flatness and undulation mean in this scene um, to this character, if it's an externalization of her interior state. Um, and then this one is egg. You'll see this. Um, and I mentioned this before. She lives in this flower room, but um, out her window is a tornado, which is a portent of things to come. Um, and this is actually what the set really looked like. You'll see how beautiful it is when it's photographed. But, um, and then this was juxtaposed against this set. Um, one is all text and one is all sort of sensation in the, in the world of flowers. These two characters share a sort of similar 
outcome. And this was very conscious. It's sort of like one is all text, one is all blooms. Um, and then this, I was just going to show you. Here's Greg with uh, um, the lead character discussing how the American flag towel should be wrapped around his waist. Um, but he, like, for instance, Greg really knew that he wanted, this is Dark, um, who's the main character, and, uh, and kind of is Greg's alter ego in some of the films. And he, for instance, Greg knew, I want there to be this portrait of, of him with these two guns against his head. That's, that's the wall. That's his whole space. It's defined by this. But he also has this another window that people climb through. So he, like I said, he knew some of these things. And then it was up to me to design them from what he said. Uh, this was my little, like again, I'm not, I wasn't doing set drawings. I was just thinking through these graphic um, representations that would then become these mostly three wall sets. It's all very simple and flat. What was the budget for the film? Two million dollars. Two million. Yeah. So around, around the same as Doom Generation, right? Yes. It was supposed to be five. Quite a bit more, and then because he, you know, didn't want to. I don't. I don't know who it was that they didn't. That he didn't want. I don't remember. I might have been told. But one of the things that's always really interesting about Greg's films is so many actors. It's their first appearance on screen. Mina Suvari and a huge array of of people who go on to be well known make their first appearance in Greg's movies. It's really intriguing. It's partially also because he he connected so well with young people. They really felt safe with him. Right. A lot of TV actors from that period, too. Back, this was when TV was really not cool. Yeah. And, uh, but bringing in... John Ritter is in this Right, film. right. Bringing in those people. <laughs> you guys might not even know who John Ritter is. Um, and then I was just going to show you this other set, because you don't really see it in this, um, in this way. This is another room at the, at the rave. And, um, and I, sorry. I completely designed this. And once again, I wanted to repeat this idea of text and um, of it being uh, a, a symbol for, for something. Um, and, and we produced this all with plexiglass. And I really wanted to do something where characters would be in the middle of an optical wall. Um, but we did it, I call it Charlie Chaplin style, where there's these, these two walls that have plexiglass. <clears throat> Um, with vinyl, cut vinyl on them, and it, they, you move them on screen like this, so it produces one, you know, this opticon situation, but then you also push them in, you can't see this, but um, on this track, um, so that the characters, the actors stay in the middle of the design as we're panning across the room. And then, as you saw in my little tiny drawing, it moves across the room and, and produces these different effects. So this is what it does, you'll see it in here. And then we used the, you can see all around the set, the, this is the ceiling of the, of the stage, and it's just these walls with no, um, no hallways, no connective tissue. It's really these flat things. But then you get this really sort of uh, um, beautiful and um, an atmospheric um, set with, <clears throat> sorry, uh, image with people against this backlit light. And so we have a lot of different kinds of ecstatic um, atmospheric images being created by this idea of flatness and light. And looking more like an advertisement than a, a world, a film's yeah. world. I yeah. Think. I guess you would call it advertising. I think of it as, as um, painting, too, yeah. as flat paintings. Uh, was there any, uh, this, so this is the third in his uh, Teenage Apocalypse trilogy. Uh, was there anything from the earlier films that you were supposed to any consistencies that you were supposed to continue or connect? No, we never, or? no. That was actually not his desire here uh -huh. at all. <laughs> it's an interesting point, but, because the first two did have connections. Some of the yeah. characters, some people reappear, reappear, but in, you know, they're not called the same name, and they don't play the same characters. This was a break. Maybe that's also why people were so shocked by it. <laughs> it was a sort of um, standalone and, ballsy reflection of people who just, I don't know, are in despair and then go out of the world. <laughs> um, so uh, with this being your third film, were, I'm guessing your early films were all low, low budget, lower budget? 
how has that <laughs> continued to, or ha how has that continued to sort of guide your the way you work now that you're working with on television and, and, and big dollars? Do these lessons that you learned then are you still applying them, or is it? Yeah, I, I mean, I wanna, uh, because I started doing it so late and I loved it so much, I had this idea that um, the budget of each movie should double <laughs> so that I could move up um, <laughs> very quick, really quickly. And mm -hmm. it, actually, that happened. And I think part of the reason that happened was because of this film, they wrote a little article about it in the New York Times. It was just about the sets. And um, people really took notice. And in fact, Chris Nolan saw this, and it was one of the reasons he called me to do Memento, and blah, blah, blah. But, um, but um, I, I think I have a, a reputation of doing things that are intense and sometimes more abstract than other designers do. And um, I do try to make something in every film that I think is above and beyond the typical idea of, of cinematic space and think about, well, where can I sort of make something that's a little bit more like art? I guess I think that when I stopped being an artist, I appreciated what you can do in art making more. Um, you can take bigger chances than you can in, in making films, and I still do try to embody that kind of idea. Um, and then I, I think that this is to, the, to my woe, possibly, I tend to push really hard against the budget and produce a lot for the money, and I think that probably is something I am actually known for, and um, I drive my crew crazy doing it. But um, what is life for <laughs> if you're not going to push as hard as you can to produce amazing things with as little money as possible. It's not about doing it for as little money as possible, but definitely whether the line is you put the money on the screen. And, uh, and it's really a, you know, a conceptual adventure that I have continued, American Gods. Um, people have said that to me my whole career. Can't believe that you did this for that amount of money. But it's because I feel like what we're making is, I don't know, you have to really take it on, or why bother? Yeah. <laughs> I definitely see a real connection with this film and American Gods. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the pop art elements, for sure. Absolutely. Know? And although this is all, all analog, all, you know, janky pieces of real things, as opposed to American Gods. With well, so everybody much thinks that American digital. Gods is all digital, and it's not. I mean, there's set extension, mm -hmm. but most of it is, is, is in production. Most of it. I'd say three quarters, for sure. Uh, it's interesting. Wow. Yeah, it's a funny, it's a funny thing. Uh, a lot of critics tend to point out Iraqi's paradoxical LA but not LA setting. I mean, like you're, you're never going to see the Bradbury Building or the, the Second Street Tunnel or Melrose. Um, instead, you're going to see convenience stores, <laughs> uh, par grocery, grocery store parking lots, um, you know, and then these amazing unreal rooms that you build. I'm wondering, was this also, like, how, how was this discussed? How was this discussed? Like, how, how do you communicate LA, not LA? How do you put that on screen? Well, one of the things I was just talking about this was that um, the need to suture anything we shot on location with these crazy sets so that you aren't just com constantly thrown out of this world into the mm -hmm. real world. and. Um, I was just walking there today. The Hollywood Reservoir has this beautiful little um, footpath, footbridge, and we shot there one scene, and it's lined with orange trees. And I said, we need to have really big pink flowers in the orange trees so that they become almost as surreal as something else. And I think that that's really important. And then I think it's just, um, I mean, part of that is like the fit of when you meet somebody and you understand what they're talking about. And, and, and then you start location scouting, and, and Greg and I both would like recognize it when we when we saw it or know where to go look for it. Things that are um, too intense for typical taste and are you know often production design describes a socioeconomic class of of its of the people who inhabit that world. That is really not a question here. There is a little indication that not everybody is of the same um, the same class, but they really inhabit the same world um, and that. I don't know how to explain how you, I mean, you just, 
you, you know it. You know, I mean, you, you, just, you talk about this, that everybody in, in, inhabits the same world, that it's abstract, that it's expressionistic, and, um, and then you find the pieces that fit that description. <laughs> I would say, well, I was just talking about backstory and how the backstory of characters is often what um, allows you to produce something that's kind of wonderful and, and specific and, and not cliched. But none of those terms fit this project. <laughs> I think that um, it's not specific, it's, um, it's, it's banal, it's also, uh, and it is cliched, and that was all part of, of what Greg wanted from the film. It's for people to inhabit this world that, like you said, is described by popular culture, um, commercials, mediated is the word we would use today, which really wasn't a word then yet, um, and yet still soulful for the inhabitants. Right. I mean, I think the, the two words that come up most often in reviews of films across Iraqi's career are camp and nihilism. So, and I know that he doesn't like the N-word. Nihilism. Uh, but, but I wondered how he feels about <laughs> camp, because I, I definitely see, I mean, there's, there's John Waters-isms everywhere in these, in these films. I and think one of the things about you know, camp, one of the descriptions of camp is that it empowers the audience, the viewer, to participate in it. And I think that that's one of the reasons that he likes that description as opposed, as opposed to nihilistic. Because I think that he feels that this, particularly this film, this idea that it's um, an interior, I mean, an exteriorization of, of the, the ether that these people live in, um, that that can be communicated and, and joined by um, the viewers and that they can make their own choices and um, critique of the, pro of the, the world via that mm -hmm. empowerment. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you about music. I mean, my, my, my introduction to Iraqi was the soundtracks. So I'm like, well, who is this lunatic, you know, putting <laughs> slow dive on every, you know, every soundtrack. Um, how, at what point in the production did the, mu did the music come in? <clears throat> um, I'm trying to remember if it was ever, if any of it was called, a few songs, a few pieces of music were actually called out in the script. But more likely, um, and in both of the films I did with him, he would give me a DVD and say, it's going to be like this, so that you listen to it and put yourself in, in the space of it. Um, and then they would be working on the rights and, and where the needle drop would be um, in the finished film later. Um, there were, I can't remember exactly which ones would have been in this. When we were watching it, I might remember um, which pieces of music were called out in the script, but occasionally there were. Um, but, uh, yeah, and how he wrangled all of that is just as mysterious as how he ended up with all of these kind of well-known and great actors um, playing crazy parts in his films. I think he just, what he was describing really appealed to a lot of people, and they agreed to have their music or be in the film for very, very little money, and uh, it was, I guess it would, you would say it was, it was sort of, it was a good time on the set for the most time. Greg's very into it, he laughs a lot, he runs around with his shirt off all the time, um, and uh, it was very copacetic kind of situation. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that was, we talked a little bit before everyone sat down about, viewing films on the small screen versus the big screen. And I wondered, too, I mean, in this period, with a filmmaker like Iraqi making these tiny films, they would have, he would have known they would have had a, a, a very short life in the theaters. So I wondered if he was, or, you know, a theater here, a theater there. So I was wondering if, was he thinking about when it came out on VHS? Like, was he, was he thinking about how how it would be consumed, because most people would have consumed these films on I don't, a small I screen. Don't, I think that for Greg, writing it, shooting it, editing it, watching it, he's done. <laughs> I, think that that, I think that that changed um, as he went on. I think that by the time he did Mysterious Skin, indie film had be, really become a thing people would be seeing it. But prior yeah. to that, I think he was really used to making these things that would drop off, that would be 
maybe this is also part of, of, of his plan um, that would have a lot of chat around them and then not necessarily be available. I often, um, I have had this experience a, a more times than I can tell you, which is always surprising to me, where I will run into somebody who tells me what this film meant to them when they saw it in the 90s, usually people who don't live in, on the coasts, who live in the middle of the world and were, wanted to be artists or were gay. I have a student working, working with right now as a sculptor who said, you just don't know what that film meant to me as someone who needed to see themselves on the screen someplace and they saw it once and it, I think it etched themselves in, in, their, in their psyche and, and never let go. Um, I think that that's the quality that he's looking for in these early films. I think mm -hmm. that's changed now, but um, I think that that really is the quality he's looking right. for I then. I mean, he's definitely you know, one of the very few filmmakers in Los Angeles who were putting these outsider, these weirdos on, on the big screen, <laughs> you know, and, and, and letting, you know, letting all us weirdos, you know, come and, and, and have people, places to, to identify with. I don't so. think he thinks that they're weird. I think he thinks it's the world that he inhabits. You know, I think this is something about Los Angeles. I always say this. Well, this is an idea about Los Angeles from like Rainer Bantam, that it's zones and that you make your own Los Angeles based on what path you take through it. And I think that this is Greg's path and it, it describes his Los Angeles to a T and, um, and he doesn't care about anything outside of it. <laughs> Which I think is, you know, Everybody should make work like that. <laughs> right. um, yeah, one, a great Iraqi quote I ran across when getting ready for this was uh, from an interview in, I think, 1998. He says, reality to me is boring. What's interesting is taking that reality and creating this hyper-reality. That's where my films exist in this controlled and created world. So um, since working with Greg, like, have you who are the other filmmakers that you've come into contact with who are looking for a hyper, love. <laughs> hyper reality? Yeah, who do you, hyper who else reality. Do you love? Actually, I, you know, I fluctuated between um, doing films like Recount that were really set in history mm -hmm. and Bobby with films that are, I guess I still use the word expressionistic because I think it works. Um, for many years, it would be one and then the other and one and then the other, and they would be connected by the directors always telling me they wanted to redefine realism. <laughs> it, made, it meant some, such different things to so many different people. But it was pretty much when I met David Slade and started working with him, I actually had seen Hard Candy many years ago um, because I was just about to do this little movie with Ellen Page, and someone said, you should watch this, it was before it came out. And I loved Hard Candy, and I was sort of like, I wanna work for that person. He makes the kinds of things I wanna work with. And, um, and I was introduced to him, oddly, through the people I did Homeland with, who were doing, <laughs> who were not prepared for David Slade, but we were doing a pilot with him, and we really, clicked and I did Hannibal with him and um, an American Gods and a couple other things and continue to work with him and I think he's a genius and um, we talk the same language. I think it's a really important idea. But since then, since Hannibal particularly, most of the projects have been on this sort of fantasy experimental, I mean more expressionist to kind of land mm -hmm. and I, I do um, love it and don't necessarily long to go back to the idea of of depicting realism. Um, I haven't gotten bored of it yet, <laughs> again, so. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to read another, another Iraqi quote, because this, this actually came up in an email that you sent me before we met. Um, it says, the world of nowhere is, in a way, typical of my worldview, in the sense that both race and sexuality are, as far as issues go, very neutered. I mean, there's a utopian vision of the world as this place where sexuality is not really an issue, where characters are not really gay or straight or bisexual, they just sort of are. And in the same way, there are African-American characters and Asian-American characters and Latino characters, and they're all in this melting pot. There's not really an issue of, I'm black and you're white and we're in this relationship, relationship so how do we navigate our differences? The world of nowhere in particular is very colorblind in the sense that as an Asian American raised in Southern California, I grew up very assimilated. My ethnic identity is not like a separatist sort of thing. It doesn't keep me from other people. It's not something that I view as this huge difference. 
And I, I was wondering if you could speak to this, to this color blindness then, uh, but also now, because obviously it's a very different time. Well, I was I just telling you that he was the first person who I ever heard say, if everybody married and bonded and mated with somebody outside their race, then racism would be ended in one generation. And I think that that is the world he wants to and doesn't have it. And, and it's exactly what you're saying. Like, race is not an issue in the films. And they were so, so far ahead of their time and still are in that regard. It's just a, an, um, a representation of uh, the world in which many people of different races and, and straight, gay, confused sexuality, whatever, um, exist, coexist without question. And it was, you know, ahead of its time, and um, and it, the fact of it, the fact of its existence on the film, as I think, a stronger political political statement than most of the projects that try to take that as a point and and produce a narrative about it. Cool. Is there something else you wanted to read? No. Also, no? I think we've covered. Just holding it. that. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So, I guess. Well, first of all, I want to thank. Patty for coming in. Thank <laughs> all of you for listening to us talk. Yeah, listening to us talk. Um, and uh, <clears throat> before we launch into the film, I should probably repeat my trigger warning here. There is a <laughs> lot of sex and violence in this film's svelte 76 minutes. And to quote from the parental guide warning on IMDb, this film nowhere is filled with bizarre sexual content, a lot of which was a lot of which is presented in a surreal atmosphere. Uh, also, most of the characters are seen doing drugs at some point. So that's your warning. Uh, but I, but I want to close, before we go into the film, with, an act, with one final quote from Greg Araki responding to this sort of thing. He says, I couldn't make movies like this if I started to worry about what Jerry Falwell is going to have to say about it. <laughs> Just Google Gary Fal Jerry Falwell, <laughs> then you'll get it, all right? Yeah. So don't leave, stick around. This is an amazing work by amazing creator creators, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, actually. Okay, <laughs> that's good.